I'm just gonna invite everyone to turn their cameras back on just uh, so we can take questions. If there's any audience questions, I also just wanna say that all of these are so fascinating. And I just wanna say thank you so much for sharing today. I, I feel like I'm really just like such a student at heart. So I'm really like getting so much like delight from this. So thank you guys so much. Uh, I don't see any questions yet. I'll give people a little, little time. Are there questions that you all have for each other? I would ask Kelsey, how did you get started on your, on your book? That's a good question. I, um, the seeds of it grew out when I was in an undergrad, I was in Southern Mexico doing research for my undergraduate thesis on indigenous social movements. Um, but I was seeing the interconnectedness there between immigration and indigenous rights. And in particular, I had this conversation while I was there with the man next to me on the bus who had been deported from California. And he asked me, how is it that you can come to my country for two weeks to study my people when I've been repeatedly denied for a visa to go back and visit my family in your country? And that question stuck with me, how could it not? And I didn't have a good answer at the time, but it caused me to want to dig deeper in again, uh, like I said, how is it that race and nationality and class all play a role in who gets to come to the US? So that's kind of, yeah, birth the, the inspiration to, to go back and dig deeper into that question. Oh, we can't hear you, hold on. I've got, I've got a question for everybody. Um, what was the most difficult thing as a writer that you encountered in working on your book? I, I know what it was for me, but I'm just curious what it was for other folks. I can take a crack at it. What was really hard for me is that I started this book about 10 years ago. And when I started it, um, I kind of had a sense for how it might go, but I didn't, I didn't really know. But over the course of the past 10 years, we've had a major collapse of ecosystems in Northern California. And so the end point of the story kind of that I thought I was starting with was changing literally almost every year as I was trying to come to the end, to the end point of my book. Um, when I started out, I was hoping that I could end the book with an experience of eating this animal and kind of trying to think about this animal as food. And literally while I was working on it, that that aspect of the book of realizing that this animal is so much more vulnerable and um, that the crises that we're facing are so much more, um, that they're here now, um, made it really hard to figure out how to, how to end. And um, in any case, it, that was one of my challenges, but I think, it, uh, I think the timing all, it all ended up um, okay, but that was my big challenge. I can jump in. Um, for me, it was figuring out my relationship to this book and to this topic. Um, and that came from the inception where I was interviewing migrants. And for the first you know, few months that I was uh, at the migrant shelter I was at, I didn't do structured interviews. I just had conversations because I was trying to figure out, well, well, how do I, how do I engage with this subject? How do I, um, how do I approach it? Um, but I think that time was necessary. Um, and what I found was that far more people than I expected wanted to share their stories. Um, they wanted people in the US to know about the situations that they face. Um, but, but throughout I've wrestled with what is my role um, in terms of, of sharing these stories and, and in terms of, of doing speaking events in terms, I still wrestle with that. So um, it's, it's a constant process. I guess, I guess I'll jump in. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that those are, those are both really great responses. I think that um, one of the things that was challenging uh, for this particular project was kind of thinking about how to tell the story uh, with the vastness of, of information at hand and also 
um, the sort of different ways of knowing, you know, uh, that, that we're sort of competing. So with this project, as opposed to my 19th century work that I'd done, you know, on Frederick Douglass, I, I did, I, I hear Frederick Douglass is still doing amazing things, but I was never able to interview him with, it, with this project. I was able to actually interview the students who hosted Baldwin and Buckley um, at Cambridge, you know, and, and, uh, and also have access to the Buckley papers at Yale, which is just this incredibly vast archive where, I mean, in addition to all the published writings he did, uh, a lot of private correspondence, interoffice memos at National Review, all of that is there. And then in the course, over the course of working on the book, Baldwin's papers, which had been in his sister's house for 30 years, uh, were, um, were opened at the Schomburg Center for Research of Black Culture at Har in Harlem. And, um, and so then all of a sudden in the midst of writing it, which is, gr which is great, right, as I'm working on the book, but also I had written half the books. Now all of a sudden I have Baldwin's archive to go into um, and so that was, that was really, really challenging, but I mean, I would say that, and then also in, with this story, right, because I was writing, I really sat down to start writing in a serious way in January, 2016, the, the political world in which, you know, uh, we were living, uh, we still are living, um, you know, I, obviously that fueled, you know, my interest in the relevance of this story um, and the urgency of this story, but I did want to try to tell the story in a way that was as fair to Buckley as it could be, although I think Baldwin is the hero of the story, um, because I really wanted to try to give readers a sense of how Buckley was, was navigating the world. I saw somebody put that question in the chat for me of kind of how do I read Buckley's mind? But yeah, so that was the other major challenge I had as, as a writer. Yeah, if I can end, uh, add to this. Um, there were really two challenges, one of which was uh, simply the pain of going back and reading things that were almost 30 years old and coming, confronting once again my undergraduate voice, which was not very good at the time. Um, but it was also that um, once I got everything assembled and began to try and build the uh, narrative, uh, the conclusion was a very difficult thing to write uh, in part. And tr I had let I had very deliberately let everybody else's voice come to the front. And it wasn't until I was at the National Humanities Center on a uh, scholarship uh, or a fellowship and uh, working on it uh, for about half the day every day, uh, uh, trying to get the manuscript in order and then throwing something before a friend of mine at North Carolina State. And he came back and whacked me upside the head and said, no, you got to put yourself in. You got to actually let it fly because you're too passionate to keep that suppressed, that that has to be part of your solution or your resolution to this. And it, as a result of that, it, it um, the book, the whole book had to shift uh, once I did that and had to go back through again. Uh, I wasn't keen to put myself into the narrative, but there were a couple of places where it was just so obvious that I had to in order to situate myself that um, it it's not the impulse I have as a writer, but it was the one that was right for the story in that respect. Ned, Ed, are you going to answer your own question? Or if you don't answer, answer another question. I was going to try and slip by. Um, the, the two things that were difficult for me, um, one was just I had certain preconceptions about some of the presidents going in. And as I learned more about the challenges they faced, um, my, my opinion sort of shifted. So keeping a kind of even balance of you know not being too hard on Warren Harding and things like that. Um, were was a was a, a difficult task. Um, the other thing was the the research rabbit holes. I'd occasionally find things that um, sounded almost too good to be true, and as I was checking them, I'd find out that I really couldn't verify them. Um, and so I have a whole big file of things that I want to go back to and look at and see see if I can figure out if someone really did call uh, Herbert Hoover a capon. Um, and things like that. We have another um, question. Any tips for your approach to second or third drafts? I find it harder than the first draft since the originality of the story has passed. I'll, I'll weigh in very quickly. I, I, I've uh, long been an admirer of John McPhee. And uh, as he argues, you really don't start dry writing until draft number four. 
uh, ultimately, uh, I have no idea how many drafts. What I can tell you is the pain and suffering of the copy editors at OSU Press, where uh, we ended up going through five proofs and some substantial changes because at, at some point, so I, I, I warned my editor a long time ago, you're going to have to grab this and take it away from me because that's the only way it'll ever be done. One thing I did this time that I had always resisted doing before was reading the final manuscript out loud. And then I could hear all the places where I was really being stupid. Yeah, I, I was going to say uh, something similar to that. I mean, this book, um, and this this kind of predated this book slightly, but I, I started writing by hand upon sketch pads with no lines. And you know, I, I'm the cognitive scientists, you know, tell me there's something different happening, right, with us when we're writing in that way. And um, that was really liberating for me. Uh, and, um, and so I would say that. And so my process that I think made the sort of draft, the idea of drafting very different was, was having that, you know, that as a starting point. And then, you know, then and not having to stare at the computer all the time. Uh, and then as, as Ed's saying, once I did type it up in the computer and then reading it aloud is another thing I, I, would, I did start doing, um, which, you know, it can be painful, uh, but it's, I think it's so helpful just in terms of finding the rhythm of your prose. And uh, so, yeah, I think just use, utilizing different methods of expressing what you're trying to say and listening to what you're trying to say, uh, th those two things are crucial tips for, for me. I would just say, I think that um, the, the question asker has nailed the, uh, the difficulty of the writer's life on the head. I mean, that is really hard, that it's the joy of learning that is so compelling. And so then after you've done that and you have to figure out how to communicate it, it's, it is challenging, especially if it's a big topic or a long topic. And um, so one of the things that I think I would say is a tip for improving manuscript or improving drafts is um, at various times to just go through with particular uh, ideas in mind, you know, to go through thinking about verbs or to go through thinking about first sentences of paragraphs or to go through with kind of an agenda. And um, I think that helps you to see the manuscript fresh. And I wish I could, I mean, I guess as Joe says, one could do that forever, but um, those are some, that's I think a little, at least a trick. And sometimes that opens your way to seeing things differently. I think another thing that's underrated is taking walks uh, by yourself and just um, having time or runs and just having time to think. Um, sometimes when there's a stuck point and you're trying to figure out how am I gonna make that those two things connect? I find that that's, that's a helpful thing to do. To add to Anne's point briefly, reading writers too that you admire that kind of do that point well. So if I was, you know, for instance, trying to add more um, descriptive language to a draft, I would read writers that I really admired in that way so that those words and were kind of percolating through my head as I went back. That, that kind of like gives words to a question I had. Are there any, I mean, I'm sure there are, <laughs> but are there uh, writers or other books that you all were reading alongside your writing for these projects? I actually read the the McPhee book draft number four as I was as I was writing because I use it in a class I use it in a class now um, and it was really helpful I mean there there's a long section where he talks about computers that was a little um, dreary but most of the rest of it was uh, um, all helpful useful information. Um, At the time I was. Uh really doing the most intensive writing on this. Actually, I was doing exactly the opposite. I was, really, I was reading really, really bad speech because I was going through the congressional record and watching people go on endlessly with shaggy dog stories and uh, threads that would drop and what have you. And in a way, it reminded me that, that you know, I don't want to, mine to end up this way. So it kind of gave me, you know, through bad examples, uh, some important lessons about thinking about, all right, how do you pull a thought through efficiently and well rather than what these people are doing? 
I like that method. <laughs> yeah, I guess um, I'll just jump in. I mean, I, I think in, in the case of this book, um, you know, I think one of the things that was helping me as a writer uh, was just reading, you know, Baldwin and, and Buckley to some extent, and both were gifted writers and, and both were interested in the craft of writing. Um, and I think that pretty much the reading that I was doing that was non, uh, you know, not material for the book was, was probably all fiction. And, and in part, I mean, this, that's because, um, I mean, not only do I like to read fiction, but, um, but also I, I think that this was um, a book I realized pretty early on I'm a political theorist by training. So, um, you know, I don't, this is, th this was definitely a different approach for me to tell, because it really was, it occurred to me very early on, this was a story, right? I had to tell a story with these two main characters. Um, and so really thinking about storytelling, you know, in a more um, intentional way, uh, I think was sort of part of my process in this, in this form. And I, and I should say that one, you know, sort of big tip for writers that I, I feel like now that I've written this book and taught me a lot about writing that I didn't know before. And, and one of the big tips is, is really allow your subject, right, to, to guide you, right? Don't, we're, many of, you know, for me, this was a process of unlearning as much as it, like unlearning everything I had been taught about how I was supposed to write as a political theorist and doing what the material was telling me I had to do. And so I think that's a really important tip for, for whatever kind of writing you're doing is, yes, the training you've gotten from, you know, all your teachers and professors and colleagues is great, but you might have to unlearn a lot of the things you've been taught. That's, a, I think that's an important thing. I'll just throw a couple books out there. Um, Oscar Martinez is a reporter who I read a lot of his work. Um, the Beast in particular um, is his book. Uh, Lauren Markham's The Far Away Brothers, um, several others, but then the writer I was thinking about as I talked about reading descriptive writing before I kind of dove into that part of the process is Jasmine Mord. I just feel like I it, I read so many different books over the course of um, of writing this book. I, I can't th quite think of any in particular that were particularly influential. I read a lot of books about history of fisheries, including by uh, the popular author Mark Kurlansky, but also more scholarly authors that had written about that topic. I was actually mostly finding uh, very little written about the topics that I was writing about, and so. Um, I kind of, you know, as I was looking for models, I didn't find them. And uh, I felt um, at times, you know, I felt a compulsion to tell an epic story in, a, in an age when in fact, we're so often asked to speak in sound bites or, uh, you know, kind of TED talk, make your three points. Um, so that was a challenge, but um, anyway. That's awesome. I'm like taking mental notes. <laughs> Thank you all so much for your time. This was, all, I am not even lying when I'm saying that I'm having a great time right now. It's awesome. So thank you so much. Everyone who's joined us, thank you for being here. I hope you all can join us on May 2nd at 7 p.m. to find out who the OBA winners are, but you're all winners to me in my heart. So thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. Thanks, everybody. That was great. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thank you all. Very nice to meet you all. Great to meet Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Take, Take care. care. Bye-bye.